Today I lead you into what is known as the biblical way of the cross. It was first introduced by Pope John Paul II in the year 1991. It's slightly different from the traditional way of the cross because some stations rest on tradition like the three falls of Jesus. In any case, the biblical way of the cross or the traditional way of the cross are meant to draw us into the life, death, and the resurrection of Jesus. And so this celebration of the way of the cross is not just an occasion to be transported 2,000 years back in time. Rather, it is an invitation from Jesus, a call from Jesus to dare to walk as Jesus himself did. So at the start, we remind ourselves that we are not here as mere observers, but participants. Hence, I urge you to enter into this as an experience. I invite you to listen not just with your ears, but also with your hearts. I ask you to pray not just with your lips, but with your soul. And then we will have touched the cross of Jesus. Or more importantly, we have allowed the cross of Jesus to touch us and to redeem us. We are here to embrace the cross with Jesus as we walk with him. For he alone can make our cross meaningful. For he alone can turn our painful cross into a way that is life-giving, a way of redemption, a way truly of life. Let us therefore be aware of two things. First, the suffering that we all go through. And secondly, the crucified and the risen Jesus walks with us in our suffering. So our prayer today is not just about the trail or the way to Calvary. Rather, it is the existence of the cross in our homes, our parish, our city, our country and the world. But with this important fact, Jesus walks with us in our suffering. And because Jesus walks with us and in us, his people, we can say that Jesus goes again to be crucified in us. Bishop Fulton Sheen expresses this very dramatically. He says this, You are described in the gospel, you are foreseen, even named. And it's only necessary that you open the book and you will recognize yourself immediately. So then, dear friends, the passion begins in the year 2022 with the same roles, the same characters as it was at the time of Jesus. Take a look at your own home or neighborhood. Is there someone who suffers, who's lost a loved one in death, who's lonely, in pain, enduring shame and humiliation? Someone who experiences the cross. Take a look at society around us. There is injustice and discrimination. People are oppressed and brutalized. Collectively, whole groups are burdened under the weight of the cross because of casteism, because of language, because of petty politics. Here they are, all are waiting for us. Yes, you and me. Who will be Simon of Cyrene? Who will be the women of Jerusalem? Come, the parts are being distributed. There's some role for everybody. Nobody is going to be left out. Does anyone want to be Pilate? Or someone wants to be Peter? Who wants to be the beloved disciple? And does anyone want to be Judas? There are different people all around the cross. Some are standing nearby, some watching from a distance. Where do you stand? Where do you take your place? What an extraordinary opportunity is ours. We can choose our own roles. We can be for Jesus, whomever we want to be. We can be in the enormous crowd of his enemies or merely hide among the indifferent bystanders. Or we could choose to be his faithful disciples with attentive faces, love in our hearts, ready with gestures of compassion. Therefore, 
let us enter into this experience, the way of the cross, so that it becomes for us the way of redemption, the way of life. The first station, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. I read to you from the Gospel according to Matthew. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet, not wa what I want, but what you want. Jesus knew that suffering, torture and death awaited him. Jesus had a choice. Should he stay or should he escape? Is there any way to avoid all this suffering? Jesus was praying not just to avoid a terrible death, but to discover and to obey God's will and to find the strength to face it and to embrace it. Jesus shows us how to pray when we are in agony. Jesus first cries out to the Father about what he finds so painful and what he is struggling about. My Father, if it is possible, let this cup, this cup of suffering pass from me. Yet, not what I want, but what you want. Jesus wants to do his Father's will, even if it means embracing the cross in obedience. In prayer, Jesus surrenders to the Father. He is able to trust, to let go into the hands of the Father all that he is agonizing about. And so we enter into this first station aware of our own personal situation, where we are agonizing in our own personal garden of Gethsemane. It could be the fact for some of us that we are aging or sickly, we struggle to cope with it and don't want to be a burden to others. It could be a troubling medical diagnosis, a financial problem, search for better housing or for a better job. It could be in the area of difficult relationships, perhaps between husband and wife, parents and children, brothers and sisters, in-laws, close friends. It could be a sense of betrayal leading to hurt and rejection or some difficult decision where we sweat blood over it. We do what we can and what we need to do, even as we pray. And Jesus shows us how to pray when we are in our own agony. The need to let go, to surrender, whatever is troubling us. My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. What is it? that we are agonizing in our lives at this moment. In silence, we surrender it into the hands of a loving God. Jesus is ever at our side. He never abandons us. So let us not be overwhelmed by fear or the weight of worry. For with Jesus, we can allow the way of the cross to become for us the way of redemption, the way of life. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us. The second station. Jesus is betrayed by Judas and is arrested. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. I read to you from the Gospel according to Mark. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. There surely would have been some goodness in Judas. But Judas was certainly misguided. Misguided enough to bring harm to Jesus, to others, to himself. Jesus treated him as a friend. After all, Judas was created in the very image of God. After all, Jesus himself chose Judas as one of the twelve. 
Jesus even washed his feet. It did not mean that Jesus condoned the act of treachery and betrayal. But Jesus was able to look beyond this act of betrayal and see in him the image of God. Before we throw stones at Judas, we must examine ourselves as to how we live as disciples of Jesus. It can happen in our families, our religious communities, in our convents. It's easy to blame Judas and yet we also are guilty of betrayal. It plays out in different ways and in different degrees. Most of our betrayals are regarding life relationships or life commitments. It happens in marriages, in the priesthood, in religious life. It concerns spouses, community members and the responsibility of our respective vocations. For us, priests, nuns, sisters, brothers who live in religious communities, we profess to be available to God and to God's people. But if we are narcissistic and turn to inwards, we could just be selfish bachelors or sour spinsters, not joyful celibates, open to God and to God's people. Else we betray our vocation. The same could happen to a husband and wife in marriage. Instead of being there for each other, they get lost in other activities or relationships. As Christians, we've been baptized and commit ourselves to Jesus. How seriously do we try to live and love as disciples? When we choose to be vindictive and revengeful, refuse to forgive, this is a betrayal of our baptismal call. Let us remember two things. First, Jesus respects our freedom. He invites us, he urges us, but then he leaves us free either to accept or reject, even betray. And the second, Jesus, by loving us, waits for us to respond to his grace and to repent. Remember, Jesus is rich in mercy and forgiveness. God can, God can turn everything to a good purpose. Remember in Romans 8, 28, for those who love God, everything works together for good. Even Judas's betrayal became, through divine providence, the occasion for Jesus' supreme act of love for the redemption of the world. That betrayal, painful as it was, led to the way of the cross and became for us the way of redemption, the way of life. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us. The third station, Jesus is condemned by the Sanhedrin. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. The Gospel according to Luke. All of them asked, Are you then the Son of God? He said to them, You say that I am. Then they said, What further testimony do we need? We have heard it ourselves from his own lips. Jesus is dragged before the Sanhedrin, an assembly of the Jewish religious leaders. They decided that Jesus was to be killed. Now they must cook up a reason to present it to the ultimate sentencing authority, the Romans. The Sanhedrin manipulated justice and pronounced Jesus guilty of blasphemy. They said he deceived people by pretending to be the Son of God. What can be true of the court of law is just as painfully true of the court of gossip. So many of us here know what it means to be rashly judged and condemned, victims of the court of gossip. We have been judged even before being given a hearing. And this is very damaging to relationships. It is painful. But then on the other hand, some of us have stood in judgment on others. We speak badly of persons, especially in their absence, but put on a smiling face in their presence. We impute motives, we speculate, we think we can read others' minds, which we then believe and justify as facts. We feel tempted to judge with an urgency and an intensity, but we want to begin with others, not with ourselves. Gossipers preside over a court of their own making, where they are the judge, the jury 
and the executioner all in one. Pope Francis says that gossipers are like terrorists. They drop a bomb and then run away. <laughs> the Sanhedrin as an institution no longer exists. But as a practice and a way of life, sadly, it continues to this day in the court of gossip. So let us stop and catch ourselves and examine that if this is so in our lives, whether we ourselves are guilty of it. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us. The fourth station. Jesus is denied by Peter. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. From the Gospel according to Luke. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. At that moment, while he was still speaking, the cock crowed. The Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord and how he said to him, Before the cock crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Peter, who proclaimed Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter, whom Jesus trusted with leadership. Peter, who when many walked away said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter, who said, others will leave you, but I will never deny you. Now this Peter denies Jesus not once or twice, but three times. How could Jesus have responded? Peter, I'm done with you. Yes, I trusted you so much and this is what you do? I chose you over others and this is how you behave? Don't ever show your face to me again. This is how many of us would respond. We fling the past at people's faces with a self-righteous triumph. No, Jesus did not say anything like this at all. Jesus just looked at him. Not a look of condemnation, but of a wounded love. A loving look that evoked repentance and opened the door to healing. And Peter weeps. They are tears of repentance and of healing. And Peter could never go back to denying the Lord after that. It is not fear and terror that impels us to change, only love. St. Alphonsus Liguori, the founder of us Redemptus, insistently repeats, any change or repentance based on fear will never last, only that based on love. Jesus persists in loving because love alone changes, love alone heals, love alone heals helps us to grow. I'm sure that we try to be faithful to the Lord in so many ways, in ways that are so committed and dedicated. But it could also be that we have denied the Lord by the values we live by, by failing to participate in the life of Jesus, His body, the church. Has the regular Sunday Eucharist become a source of life and strength for us? Or do I go for Sunday Mass only occasionally when I feel like it? Or again, have I allowed the Lord to heal me of all the denials and to forgive me tangibly and concretely in the sacrament of confession? Today, Jesus looks at us tenderly. Let his gaze rest on you and on me. Love alone washes away our denial and our betrayal. It is a look of love. And like Peter, we weep at being loved so much in spite of our failures. And even our denials, now repented and confessed, become a way of redemption, a way of life. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us.
the fifth station jesus is judged by pilot we adore you o christ and we bless you because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world a read from the gospel according to mark as soon as it was morning the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council they bound jesus led him away and handed over to pilot pilot asked him are you the king of the jews he answered him you say so then the chief priests accused him of many things pilot asked him again have you no answer see how many charges they bring against you but jesus made no further reply so that pilot was amazed so pilot wishing to satisfy the crowd released barabbas for them and after flogging jesus he handed him over to be crucified pilot is playing political games it does not matter that an innocent life is at stake after all he wants to please his roman masters at the same time he wants to pacify the people of jerusalem who are crying out for jesus's blood and justice and truth are the first casualties in this process pilot washes his hands a simple but powerful gesture of escaping responsibility has that ever happened to us have we ever refused responsibility giving up on people entrusted to our care have we washed our hands using every convenient justification passing the buck escaping responsibility like pilot do we refuse to face the truth and so act unjustly this happens in marriages and families between spouses or parents and children when because of a conflict we lack the humility the patience the persistence to sit down and address matters and to resolve it this happens in governments and countries when leaders wash their hands off even worse fiddle while the city and the country burns terrible they can be proactive destruction of the social fabric by leaders and political parties playing the religion or the language or the culture card this happens when the sacred institutions of democracy are demeaned when the press is rendered servile when whistle blowers at those who speak truth to power are threatened simply because modern day pilots have little regard for truth and justice democracy is about caring and protecting the weakest and the vulnerable the poor and the disadvantaged it is not to preserve the benefits of the rich and the powerful nor a display of the brute force of a majority these so called leaders lack the political will because they are too busy eyeing their position and the power and trying to work at it until the next election this happens when governments turn a blind eye to mob violence and lynching and these mobs get bolder because they receive political patronage and when all this happens it only causes painful crosses to be placed on the shoulders of an already struggling poor and yet in the midst of all the seemingly hopeless scenario we also see people being drawn out of their apathy and indifference it happens when common people take a stand and call governments to accountability they dare to speak truth to power and it is the unleashing of the people's power for good that enables the way of suffering and the way of the cross to become a way of redemption a way of life have mercy on us o lord have mercy on us the sixth station jesus is scourged and crowned with thorns we adore you o christ and we bless you because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world from the gospel according to john then pilate took jesus and had him flogged 
And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate knows, even admits that Jesus is innocent. Yet Pilate gave in to the blood lust of the crowd and finally handed Jesus over to be scourged and then killed. By calling him the king of the Jews, they mocked him. They dressed him in purple, the color worn by kings. And for a crown, they gave him a crown of thorns. What cruel irony. The scourging, the crowning with thorns continues even today. You could call them present day martyrs. Faith continues to be mocked and is under threat even today. We think of how false accusations are made against the Christian faith and lumpen mobs attack believers and destroy crosses and churches. But this violence and scourging are not restricted only to Christians but to every other group of persons of other faiths as well where every child of God suffers brutality at the hands of oppressors and tormentors. Not all violence is bloody and physical. Persecution can be done not just by armed gangs, but policies of governments across the world. Those in power make sure they discriminate against those who do not belong to their ideology or their religious belief. Mocking of faith continues even today. Attacks could come from the secularist or atheist circles as well. This is often done through sarcasm and cynicism. They ridicule believers and say that faith is a farce and meant to keep you as infants. You hear cynical comments like, Oh, so you still go to church? Oh, so you still pray? You may not be prodded with a spear, but you will be poked with a sarcastic tongue and a cynical attitude. You may not be burned with crackling fame, flames, but you will be attacked and mocked with cackling laughter. Scourging and crowning, mockery and persecution continue even today. Persecutors and oppressors try even today to disfigure the face of God and the body of Christ. But the cross of Christ has the last word. The cross of Jesus triumphs even today and it becomes then for us the way of redemption, the way of life. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us. The seventh station Jesus bears the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. From the Gospel according to John. Then he, Pilate, handed him, Jesus, over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. Jesus said, on more than one occasion, if you wish to be my disciple, take up your cross and follow me. Now, not all suffering can be considered as a cross that we must bear. Not all suffering has to be accepted with passivity. That is why we medically treat illnesses and seek to relieve pain. Not all suffering must be tolerated. Some experience Suffering that should not and need not happen, like abuse and violence, especially in the home. Some who suffer, but take great care to hide it in silence and tears, to supposedly preserve the good name of the family. This silence empowers abusers who dare to suff inflict suffering even more. When people are subject to an abusive or toxic relationship, are treated like a doormat, especially in a home or family, that is not acceptable. Help must be sought. You could call these Good Friday people. Others suffer because of noble choices made. These could be people like conscientious judges, 
courageous journalists, when they take a stand on behalf of the oppressed or suffer injustice, they face attacks, insults, even death. Such upright people suffer because modern day leaders like Herod, Caiaphas, Pilate and chief priests and the scribes. We could call all these various people who suffer on, the on account of justice as Good Friday people. Take a moment and see what the cross is in your life. What is it that you feel weighed down and burdened with? Surrender it to God to receive God's strength. Also be honest and ask yourself, am I responsible for bringing pain, pain and suffering, tears and fear in the lives of people, especially in my home and family? If so, if so stop being a Herod or Pilate or the Sanhedrin. Acknowledge your part in it and stop such behavior. Also take a moment now to bless someone or those you know carrying a heavy cross. Ask Jesus to send abundant grace to them to help them and to bring them his peace. And just as important, what can you do to lighten their burdens? Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us. The eighth station, Jesus is helped by Simon to carry the cross. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. It is so easy to look for God in the marvels and beauties of creation. But we can be quite blind to the ordinary, hurting, suffering brothers and sisters of us. We look for God in the marvelous and the miraculous. But God disappoints us. Jesus is hidden behind the vulnerabilities of others. Jesus identifies himself with those in need, the poor, the suffering, when we can choose to recognize him or choose to ignore him. Simon, initially may have been reluctant, but later discovered that in embracing the cross with Jesus, something moved within him. Take a look at the cross. The image of a beaten, broken and vulnerable person, that is where God is to be found. There is a proverb, if you want to become invisible, then become poor, because nobody will notice you. Which is why when God came into this world, he chose to come as a poor man. All through the gospel, we see the concern of Jesus. Whatsoever you do to the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you do unto me. When I was hungry, thirsty, stranger, naked, sick and imprisoned, we don't have to look too far. Today, we have the choice, the freedom to be any of those, the soldiers, the jeering mob, the guilty bystanders, armchair critics or Simon. We are called to be Simon. Like Simon, we will be thrown into unexpected situations. Will we say yes? Do we have the generosity and availability of Simon? Would we step out of our comfort zone to lend a hand? And as you reach out to, the, to those who are burdened, you will hear the Master say to you, Come, you blessed of my Father, enter the kingdom prepared for you. For as long as you did it to one of the least of these brothers or sisters of mine, you did it to me. Many are struggling along the way of the cross. God invites you and me to transform their cross into a way of redemption, a way of life. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us. The ninth station, Jesus meets the women of Jerusalem. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross, you have redeemed the world. From the Gospel according to Luke. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. A look at these women. They must have required courage in the face of a yelling and a screaming mob 
to show that they stood with Jesus. They stood for Jesus. Today too, we have to stand up to the pressure of colleagues perhaps, to swim against the current, to be counter-cultural, to take a stand is not easy. One could imagine the filthy abuses that would have been thrown at these women for standing up for Jesus. The women of Jerusalem teach us courage when we have to stand up for what we believe. Jesus teaches us that even in the depth of pain, he is able to focus not on himself, but on others and their struggles as well. Let us bow our heads and as we pray. Lord, we pray at this moment for all the women of the world. They are not really the weaker sex. May they treasure their moral strength. We pray for all our mothers and daughters and sisters, wives, widows and single women. For all those who stand by us in silent silence and steadfastness. Bless all mothers who struggle for us day in and day out, but do not receive gratitude. Bless all wives, help them to be a source of strength, to make their hopes a haven of peace. Bless our sisters, that they may fill the world with gentleness, goodness and moral beauty. Bless all the single women and those who are widowed and separated, who face challenges and a society that does not properly respect or understand them. Bless all our nuns and religious sisters. May their lives be a constant sign of selfless love and total availability. And give us men, dear Lord, the graciousness and manly strength to respect and honor all women. Give us men the honesty and the courage to break away from all that disrespects women. May we men raise our voices against every form of violence and abuse in our homes and societies. And may we men work to create a climate where we no longer see this as only a man's world, but see women as equal and respected collaborators in building a just world. And may we jointly embrace the cross so that it becomes for us together a way of redemption, a way of life. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us. The tenth station, Jesus is crucified. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. From the Gospel according to Luke. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. The Romans perfected the art of murder through crucifixion. But Calvary is no longer only a historical place. It is a situation. A situation of sin, not only personal sin, but also social sin. It's about personal sin where we hurt and destroy and wound each other in our relationships. It's also about social sin when those sins are embedded in society and which we practice because they are so much part of our culture. Calvary is when people are nailed, whether as child workers, domestic laborers or bonded laborers. Calvary is when people are stripped of their rights and dignity or women forced into prostitution and pornography. Calvary is when money lenders and loan sharks suck the blood of the poor. Calvary is when people are pulled caste and discriminate against others. Calvary is when people lynch another because he or she does not share their faith, their language or food habits. Calvary is when constitutional rights are trampled and people are attacked in the name of language or culture or religion. Calvary carries the burden of sin, personal and social sin, and that sin brings death. Calvary is today. Calvary is now. For where there is suffering, there is Calvary. And that is holy ground, because Jesus suffers and is crucified in that person. No longer can we say, does God know what I am going through? God knows. Does God know? 
God knows it in Christ Jesus. And when we allow Jesus to accompany us in our cross and suffering, our way of the cross becomes a way of redemption, a way of life. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us. The eleventh station. Jesus promises his kingdom to the good thief. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. From the gospel according to Luke. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He replied, Truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Let us examine the prayer of the good thief. He calls Jesus by name. The only other person is Bartimaeus in Mark 10 verse 47. He says, remember me. To remember in the Bible is for God to act. It's not just a recalling of the past. Because when God remembers, God acts. And responds, what did Jesus say? You have left it till too late. Where were you all this while? Why have you come now? No. Jesus gave him an answer of peace and without any delay, he responded promptly and decisively. Today, you will be with me in paradise. The same words of Jesus are addressed to us today. But what do we need to do to open our hearts to his redeeming love? To let in the floodgates of God's mercy. Perhaps accept our own responsibility and sinfulness, refusing to blame others for our failures. Then we too will hear Jesus say, Today you will be with me in paradise. For when we do, we experience the way of the cross as the way of redemption, the way of life. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us. The twelfth station, Jesus speaks to his mother and the disciple. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. Because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world. From the Gospel according to John. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clophus, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. Jesus wants us to experience the presence of his mother. Her faith story was a struggle story. And Jesus knew that this mother of his was too precious for him to keep to himself. He knew that we would need her. He believed that we would appreciate the precious gift with gratitude. Because she's a mother who cares for us, who understands us, who loves us. She is now our mother and we are her children. The beloved disciple. He stood at the cross. That was not the safest place to be. It took courage and love for John to be there. And Jesus acknowledges his presence. And so Jesus entrusts the gift of Mary as mother to John, who stands in place of us all. Jesus believed that we would appreciate this precious gift because she is a mother who will perpetually be there for us. We pray. Lord, we thank you for the gift of Mary, our mother. She stands at the foot of the cross as woman and mother. She seems to do nothing and yet she does everything. She offers the very being to you in silence, in solidarity, in support. She is truly a great help, a perpetual help. Mary, our mother, you have been through it all yourself. We ask that you guide us in how we allow the way of the cross to be transformed into the way of redemption, the way of life. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us. The 
13th station Jesus dies on the cross we adore you o christ and we bless you because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world from the gospel according to luke then jesus crying with a loud voice said father into your hands i commend my spirit having said this he breathed his last most religious founders are portrayed triumphantly but in any catholic church the central is the crucifix it reveals the image of what might seem as a defeated god perhaps this doesn't shock or scandalize us anymore but yet this powerful symbol is the reason for faith and for hope that is why victims and broken people in history can relate to such a god jesus did not die of sickness or in a hospital bed or of old age jesus was killed jesus was assassinated jesus was murdered it was a religious murder at the hands of the sanhedrin the religious authorities and a political assassination at the hands of the roman the government authorities and this murdered jesus takes his place together with all the innocents down through history who have been who have suffered and who have been killed persons through abortion those killed in wars those persecuted and martyred and these people suffer because of the values of the kingdom when we say that jesus died for our sins it's not just a pious statement jesus paid the price for standing up to the injustices in society for correcting the false theology of the religious authorities and for that he was murdered jesus shows us not only how we must live but how we must also die jesus looks down from the the cross and he finds familiar faces like his mother the beloved disciple but he's also surrounded by the jeering crowding mocks that mock at him as jesus looks down where would we place ourselves in silence allow jesus to speak to us from the cross have mercy on us o lord have mercy on us the final the 14th station jesus is placed in the tomb we adore you o christ and we bless you because by your holy cross you have redeemed the world from the gospel according to john after these things joseph of arimathea who was a disciple of jesus though a secret one because of his fear of the jews asked pilate to let him take away the body of jesus pilate gave him permission so he came and removed his body nicodemus who had first come to jesus by night also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about 100 pounds they took the body of jesus wrapped it with spices and linen cloths according to the burial custom of the jews two important figures joseph of arimathea and nicodemus Joseph was a respected wealthy civic leader the courage he shows in approaching pilate for jesus' body remember jesus was a condemned criminal who had been publicly executed what about nicodemus who was part of the religious council he comes first at night john 223 then he perhaps he was afraid of being seen with the rebel again in john 750 he has the courage to speak up the name of jesus against the decision of the sanhedrin and now in full public display he's made a journey of faith he has the courage to come out of the darkness into the light because he has experienced the light who is jesus and like nicodemus this way of the cross continues to be for us a journey of faith into the light Jesus is now buried in the tomb. God does not abandon us. No place is forsaken by God. Jesus descends into the very depths of the earth, the very depths of our human suffering, so that we will experience the power of his redeeming presence. And especially at death, we experience the way of redemption, the way of life. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us. the conclusion through this way of the cross we have reflected on the sufferings of jesus and the sufferings of people 
Jesus life and death turned what was a shameful symbol like the cross into a symbol of life and of victory it came because Jesus broke the power of sin the vicious cycle of hatred of inhumanity and violence God in Jesus embraced the very depths of suffering even to the point of death on the cross so the cross of Jesus celebrates not so much the almighty or the all-powerful God, but rather the all-gentle and all-vulnerable God, simply because He dares to love. The resurrection is truly glorious, victorious and triumph, but it has to pass through the way of the cross, which is embraced in love. And that is what Jesus did throughout His life, through the way of the cross and even from the cross and in his death. He whispers, more than that, he screams the word love. Such is the power of love. And he pours that love into your heart and mine. Because in love alone, we will experience the power of the cross. Love alone will enable us to experience the triumph of the cross. And because of Jesus, you and I can face tomorrow and truly Life is worth living, as our final hymn will say, because Jesus lives. We now conclude with a prayer for the intentions of the Holy Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And may we experience the power and the triumph of the cross, even as we go through life. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you, and remain with you forever. Amen. Let us live in the strength of the cross. As we take the final hymn. Oh